I'm Pat Doris. There's a water crisis in eastern Oregon, and it's not the drought. It's the pollution of groundwater that thousands use for drinking and cooking. It's a big problem that involves powerful industries and state regulators. Many victims are low income folks who do not speak English. They have little political power, but they know their drinking water is tainted and they believe it's made them sick. You'll see solutions are hard to come by. I expect many will feel the outrage of a problem that has grown unchecked for more than 30 years here. Oregon is a state that prides itself in its environmental stewardship. But in my opinion, there should be no pride over what's happened in the lower Umatilla Basin. The state's response has been a disgrace. One hundred sixty miles east of Portland, near the Columbia River, huge sprinklers shepherd along the growing season. Water is a precious commodity here. Average rainfall is only nine inches a year, a fourth of Portland's total. During the growing season, irrigation water, much of it from the Columbia River, is delivered by the moving machines, quenching the thirst of growing crops. It creates perfect green circles on the otherwise tan canvas. This is part of the largest grassland in North America. While it's rare above ground, deep under the soil, there's lots of water. And that's where thousands of people not connected to city water systems get their supply through private wells. And for most of Oregon's history, that water was safe to drink. But more than 30 years ago, that changed. And today, the problem is worse than ever. Yeah, this well here is 100 feet deep. The static level is 22 feet. And uh, they used to be good, but they're not anymore. Pat Suter began using his well 35 years ago when he moved into his home here outside the city of Boardman. Back then, he said, the water tested at about 4.5 parts per million with nitrate, a safe level according to the EPA. Nitrates are something you cannot see or taste. It's a chemical found in fertilizers and the waste of animals kept in feedlots and the water from commercial food production. In elevated amounts, it is dangerous in humans. The EPA set a limit of 10 parts per million for all public water systems. Concentrations below that are considered safe, above that not safe, especially for some groups, including young children and pregnant women. Recently, experts tested Pat's well water again. He said the new reading showed nitrates at 37 parts per million. That's nearly four times the danger level. We quit drinking this water I quit drinking it about 10 years ago when I got remarried and my wife, they wouldn't drink this water and uh, it didn't taste right. So we've been on bottled water for 10 years. And, uh, and your, your previous wife died of cancer? Yeah, she did. She drank about three pots of coffee a day for all the time we was here. And a number of dogs? And I've lost 16 dogs here with cancer. You think it's the water? I do. No tests have been able to pinpoint the water as the cause in the death of Pat's wife or his dogs, but he and many others in Eastern Oregon believe the water is indeed deadly. Up until the recent test, Pat's current wife, Sylvia, used the water for cooking. You might think that's a good idea since boiling kills most things, but it's bad when it comes to nitrates. Boiling concentrates them and makes things worse. I got the stuff because I was like, <laughs> what are we gonna do now? Yeah. Animals. I have. We have cows, and the dogs, and chickens, and we don't want all that to get sick and die because of the water. Now she's had enough. The first thing that came to me is like, it's time to move. Yeah, we need to find some somewhere else that is not contaminated yet. They would leave, but Pat worries they're stuck, and they're not alone. How in the hell do you sell your place when you can't? The well won't test. That's the big thing around here. I mean, you're stuck. You can't sell these places. The contaminated aquifer lies beneath a huge section of land, 562 square miles covering northern Umatilla and Morrow counties. It includes the towns of Echo, Stanfield, Hermiston, Umatilla, Irrigon, and Boardman. As many as 12,000 people could be at risk, according to the government. 
While you can't see it from above the ground, the fields here have vast pools of water underneath them. That's the aquifer. In the area we're focused on, as many as 4,500 private wells have drilled down through the surface to get water from the aquifer for drinking and cooking, bathing, and more. But over the decades, that pollution in the form of nitrates from farm fertilizer, commercial food production, and large animal operations have seeped down through the ground into the water and now contaminate it. It's worse in some areas than others. When people use their wells in the contaminated areas, they pull up water that looks clean but is actually polluted with nitrates. That's bad because nitrates can cause cancer and many other problems. Maria Martinez lives in the danger zone but thought her well water was safe. I was pregnant and then for us cons um, consuming all the water, the bad water that's here, we're just consuming it and I was pregnant at the time and I didn't even know that I was pregnant with my first pregnancy and I was consuming the water and then so I miscarried that baby and then again I got pregnant again and then um, still drinking the water without knowing it was con um, contaminated, another one. She had two miscarriages. She cannot prove they were caused by the water, but she believes they were. She said when she moved into her home 32 years ago, the well testing showed safe levels of nitrates, far below 10 parts per million. Recently that we got it checked, it was like 45, really sky high. Wow, for yeah, nitrates? Very, yep, very high. And it's not supposed to be above 10? No, right? no, no. What was your reaction when you saw that number? Like, oh, that just, I'm like, wow. I couldn't believe it because we were drinking from that water. We were even bathing. My kids were even in the pool and all that. With that water, just never thinking that that water was, you know, poisonous to us. She said they drank the water until April of this year when the test came back so high. Raymond Akers, who lives near Maria, had a similar experience. He bought his home 24 years ago and back then said the nitrates in his well water tested at just 4.3 parts per million. So he didn't worry about it until he recently heard the concern of neighbors. My wife and I, we rushed in and got some bottles and uh, spent a hundred and I believe it was $110 to have our well tested. And uh, it had went in that, that amount of time, it went from the 4.3 to 27.4. Wow. What was your reaction to seeing the number? I, I was shocked. <laughs> he too immediately switched to bottled water and it brought a startling change in his health. I've been fatigued for a year, for the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. I just didn't have no energy. Never put no relation to it. Don't know if it is related, but I can tell you when I stopped drinking the water, I uh, found a whole level of energy I hadn't had in 15 years. Uh, I was pretty heavy then and I dropped I dropped 70 pounds in just over six months after after I quit drinking that water. Wow, 70 just pounds. The energy level that I had to get out of get out of the house and go do something. Like all the others I met, he cannot prove the water made him sick, but he does believe it did. Luz Barajas <laughs> thinks the water led to her husband's death. Is my colleague, Celeste Ruiz, KGW's digital director, translated as we talked. She said they moved into a home 10 years ago outside the Boardman city limits. They were warned from the beginning the water was not safe to drink, but her husband sometimes ignored that. She said her husband died four years ago. Ruth Lopez is her daughter-in-law. Ruth and her husband bought a mobile home in the contaminated area three years ago. It was so well known the water was bad that the bank would not give them a loan until they put in filters and got it tested. Still, she won't use the water. Pues estamos mirando que el agua este, está muy afectada, este, no sirve para tomar ni para cocinar. Like many I met, she finds it hard to believe it's been going on this long. Se me hace mucho, digo, oh, wow, 30 años y no pueden hacer nada. Entonces, como que uno dice, te desilusionas de que dices, ay, pues si hace 30 años no pueden hacer nada, conti más ahorita, ¿no? That's right, 30 years. Today, with great pride, it gives me a good feeling to be able to announce that Oregon again is leading the nation 
in preventing pollution. Back in 1989, Oregon's legislature passed the Oregon Groundwater Quality Protection Act. Its goal is to prevent contamination of groundwater throughout the state, to conserve and restore it, and to maintain it for future generations. The law also required statewide testing of groundwater. Tests revealed the water in the lower Umatilla Basin was polluted, with many readings showing nitrates above seven parts per million, the state's threshold for danger. The Department of Environmental Quality declared a groundwater management area. The purpose of that declaration was to identify and implement practices that would reduce the nitrate levels and ultimately reduce the groundwater nitrate concentrations to below that seven parts per million. It has failed in nearly every step of the journey. To begin with, it took four years to find and report the five leading causes of contamination. It took two more years to form a committee to do something about it. A full seven years after the declaration, the committee, made up of government and industry officials, decided a voluntary plan of action would be best. Now in 2023, the state is on its third committee and the nitrate contamination is not better, it's worse leaving residents like Mike Pearson furious. These people don't give a damn what's going on. If they do, they damn sure don't do anything about it. In the rolling hills outside Echo, Oregon, it's early September and the red onion harvest is underway. Jake Madison is a fourth generation farmer here three hours east of Portland. His great grandparents started the farm back in 1914 with 160 acres of dry land wheat. Now, Jake owns a farming operation that spans 10,000 acres. He loves the land and carefully tracks how much fertilizer is applied to each crop. Like on these onions, we come out and we pull tissue tests. We pulled like eight to 10 soil and tissue tests during the key periods uh, from the 1st of June through the end of July. And then... And that's all designed to see how much... Exactly. ...fertilizer you need or don't need or exactly. what's happening with yeah. it. Yeah, and we can track what it's using, what it's not using. His fields and the others around here were carved by the great floods that swept down the Columbia River drainage from Glacial Lake Missoula during the Ice Age. It left behind a combination of sand and silt and gravel, which now makes up the soil. It's perfect for growing onions and potatoes, but if too much liquid fertilizer is applied to this land, it can easily drain into deeper ground and reach the aquifer below. In northern Morrow County, the soil is primed for leaching liquid into the aquifer below. This map reveals the challenging conditions. Red shows the high chance of fertilizer with nitrates leaching into that groundwater. Boardman, Irrigon, and Umatilla have some of the worst soils for that. Farms cover 180,000 acres in this area. Jake, over in Echo, faces a moderate risk. Still, he does extensive testing to keep his fertilizer out of that aquifer. You know, we know how every inch of water that's going on the field, we know where it's going. We know every pound of nitrogen that's going on every field, we know where it's going. We've got the soil tests on the front end and the back end to make sure that you know, we can prove we're not, not leaching it everywhere. I mean, this isn't, this isn't 50 years ago, right, from that standpoint when everything was cheap and if more was good, more is better. And so from that, you know, we, we manage and account for everything. But as he mentioned, it hasn't always been that way. And even today, most other farmers are not required to monitor their fields as closely as Jake. He's part of a special program. But for most of the 180,000 acres of irrigated farmland above the aquifer, there is no restriction on how much liquid fertilizer can be put on the land, no restrictions on when it can be applied, and since they're not regulated, there's no way to know how much liquid fertilizer is being used and whether any of it is continuing to leach into the aquifer. Who polluted the aquifer? There's no individual culprit. But back in 2011, three state agencies studied the issue and found three main contributors. Researchers found that roughly 82% of the nitrates came from irrigated agriculture, basically those farmers using irrigation sprinklers. 8% came from pastures, probably fertilizers, along with animal waste as they grazed the fields. Four and a half came from food processors. Those are companies that wash produce brought in from the fields, then send that water back out to irrigators. 
Other sources include fertilizing lawns and leaks from septic tanks. A later version of the report separated out liquid manure that comes from places like feedlots called CAFOs. That lowered the number for irrigated agriculture, but you get the idea. Ag is still the elephant in the room. Researchers believe that farmers putting too much liquid fertilizer on the ground in the past played a big role in the contamination. But it's unclear if current farming practices are making things worse or maybe even better. And scientists are not able to clearly tell when looking at water samples if they're seeing nitrates from years ago or days ago, and whether it came from farming or something else. The state of Oregon has given lip service to doing something to help for a long time. A variety of state agencies are involved. The Department of Environmental Quality is technically in charge, but appears none of the agencies have taken ownership of the overall problem. As a result, the state has failed to make meaningful change for more than 30 years. In fact, the problem is now worse than before. This graphic shows with the arrows there where the pollution got worse from 1991 through May of 2016. Green arrows show pollution levels getting better. Boardman is to the left, Echo is toward the bottom right. The numbers were compiled using test wells across the area. 52% of the wells had increasing trends of pollution, 32% had decreasing trends, and 13% had no change. Over the years, irrigated farming has expanded in the counties. A former top DEQ official says that expansion is a big part of the nitrate problem. It started with the advent of large-scale irrigation in this area. Um, and then with the increase in agriculture, of course, then you get food processors uh, to deal with the products that are being grown, and that creates wastewater that is also rich in nutrients. So we have both wastewater and fertilizer. Mitch Wogamot is retired now, but he used to run the eastern region of Oregon for the DEQ. Not any one farm is a problem, but when you have thousands of acres that are being irrigated fairly heavily and fertilizer put on it in these really porous sandy soils in this area, uh, it's very difficult to keep it from leaching down into the aquifer. In addition to farmers, nitrate water is spread on the land by the Port of Morrow. We know more about its use because it's regulated by the state with water permits. The port is a government entity located along the Columbia River near Boardman. Its purpose is economic development for Morrow County. It has docks and rail lines and an airport and cold storage and four industrial parks with attractive deals to lure companies to move there. It's also located along Interstate 84 and other major trucking routes. The port started 64 years ago, and it's wildly successful today. The Port of Morrow now has 46 companies located there in a county with nearly 13,000 people. 6,300 jobs are directly or indirectly connected to the port. The companies combined pay more than $100 million in local and state taxes. Making any moves that would restrict its business is fraught with economic and political danger. Its largest tenant? those companies involved in producing food. They use water to wash the onions or potatoes or other crops that pour in from local fields. After it's used, that water contains nitrates. The port collects the water from companies located at its sites and stores millions of gallons in these holding ponds. It also sends another seven to 10 million gallons a day out to farm fields through a network of pipes. Some of the water is spread on fields owned by the port. Some of it goes to farmers, including Jake Madison. Jake is such a valuable outlet for the port that they built a pipeline from Boardman to his farm in Echo. It stretches 16 miles. 16 miles. While the process works for Jake, the port still has more wastewater than it can get rid of. The port has been reprimanded for dumping wastewater on fields during the winter when little is growing. With no crops, it's easier for that wastewater and nitrates to leach down to the aquifer below. This past June, the DEQ slapped the Port of Morrow with fines totaling more than $2 million for dumping wastewater in the winter more than 2,000 times. The port refused a request for interviews and a tour. But public documents show the Port of Morrow has promised to invest $200 million to help with the problem. It plans to build a huge storage lagoon and take other steps to strip much of that nitrate out of the water before it's sent out. During a candidate's forum in May of 2023, 
put on by the Boardman Chamber of Commerce and posted on YouTube, Marv Padberg, who was a port commissioner at the time, said taking care of the nitrate problem will be a huge expense for the port. First off, to take care of our nitrate issues, regardless of any of the other entities do anything, it's going to cost the port upwards of 500, 600 million bucks, maybe more than that. It's unclear where the port will get that money. Back out on his farm, Jake Madison says stripping nitrates out of the water will not solve the bigger problem and is only going to cost him money. He'll need to buy more fertilizer for his crops. I, I mean, I get it from the standpoint of, great, we removed the nitrogen from this water, but I still need nitrogen to grow the crops, so I'm going to go buy fertilizer to put on the crops now. So it's kind of like, okay, you know, you didn't really change anything. Y también te desilusionas porque dices, pues no, no, siempre lo mismo y lo mismo y lo mismo y, y no hay resultados, o qué está pasando, ¿verdad? Sí, sí te, como te desanimas. They get discouraged because this is not a new discovery. The state of Oregon has known for at least 33 years that the aquifer under this ground is contaminated with dangerous levels of nitrates. Think about that, 33 years. And yet no agency, not the EPA or DEQ or any other number of agencies involved, have taken forceful action that changed the numbers. There have been a lot of meetings and lots of reports, but no meaningful change in the level of pollution. She will go out and around, bring them back. Jim Doherty is a rancher in Morrow County. There she goes. He has working farm dogs and 750 head of cattle. He's also one of the few politicians in this area who publicly sounded the alarm over the polluted aquifer. I knew it was time that somebody stood up. You know, somebody had to stand up. Um, you know, I said, as a politician, right, uh, you're always faced with the challenge, right? Is, is this the hill you're willing to die on? And uh, when I looked at this, I said, you know, this is literally the hill as a, as a politician that I'm willing to die on that others don't have to. Doherty chaired the Morrow County Commission in 2022. He declared a countywide state of emergency after tests found dangerous levels of nitrates in wells that were previously deemed safe. At that point in time, I, I knew we had a colossal challenge. A challenge known to the state and growing for decades. Back in 1989, the state of Oregon passed the Oregon Groundwater Quality Protection Act. The very next year, in 1990, samples showed nitrate levels above 10 milligrams per liter in the groundwater in northern Moro and Umatilla counties. The EPA says readings above 10 milligrams is dangerous. The results triggered a declaration under that new state law. It created the Lower Umatilla Basin Groundwater Management Area with the mouthful acronym LUBGUAMA. As part of the Groundwater Protection Act, a LUBGUAMA committee was set up to report to the DEQ to, quote, work with and advise state agencies who are required to develop an action plan that will reduce groundwater contamination. The committee was made up mostly of industry and government officials. There were studies and reports, and in 1997, a decision to move forward, asking everyone to try to do their best. The committee, quote, agreed to promote a voluntary approach for addressing the groundwater contamination area. Jim Doherty was not surprised. I think when the state first reached out in 90 and said, you have to form a, a, a committee, right, to look into this, to, to start turning this effort around, uh, it was made up of 100% of, of folks that were invested in, in the riches that, were, that it was bringing, right? And it was the fox guarding the hen house, if I might. Um, you know, and they were just kicking the can down, down, down the road. There would be no mandatory changes to any practices. No changes for farmers whose fertilizer can contribute nitrates to the groundwater. No significant changes for the 13 confined feedlot operators that spread manure with nitrates as fertilizer on their fields. No significant changes for food processors that each year collectively spread billions of gallons of wastewater on farm fields, much of it contaminated with nitrates. And so, as you might expect, industry kept doing what it had always done. Outreach programs were created to warn people with wells, and there were suggestions for industries on best practices, but no one suggests cutting back on the industries themselves. And a chronically weak and underfunded Department of Environmental Quality would do little more than watch. DEQ first 
identified the problem over 30 years ago now, and it has gotten continuously worse since then. Mitch Wogemont retired as the interim administrator for the eastern region of the DEQ. He was also part of the Lubguama Committee around the year 2000. I learned early on when I got involved in this uh, that the committee, that DEQ set up a groundwater management area committee who was charged with coming up with some solutions. Um, it frankly was dominated by food processors and irrigators. So it was kind of the chicken garden, the hen house kind of a deal. They weren't looking for the solutions that were really gonna be a solution. That, yeah, that's the way I would put it. Um, and I learned quite early that they weren't real interested in having a lot of publicity. Uh, so people didn't know what was going on and even though the, the government knew and the, the processors and farmers themselves knew, uh, they didn't really have much incentive to fix it because nobody was complaining. Wolgamott said over the years, he alerted lawmakers and suggested mandatory restrictions for industry might be needed, but nothing was done and eventually he retired. Starting in 2000, the DEQ Water Quality Division put out nine annual reports updating various efforts to educate the public and to urge best practices for industry. The report also documents that the pollution of the aquifer continued to get worse. And while that was going on, the Port of Morrow was revealing how weak the DEQ enforcement was by repeatedly violating its wastewater permit, which is designed to protect the aquifer. The port collects wastewater from food processors and other companies connected to its land. Some of that wastewater is contaminated with nitrates. According to DEQ records, the port has violated its permit more than 2,000 times from 2007 until 2022. The DEQ settled most violations, but then did fine the port $129,000 in 2015, and in October of 2023, announced the port would pay $1.9 million in fines for permit violations, with the money going to safe drinking water programs in Northern Morrow and Umatilla counties. The port will also pay $483,000 in fines to the state. At the same time, the state did not require the port to slow or stop its wastewater discharges. Instead, it agreed the port could continue to spread nitrate-laced water in the winter months until 2026, when it would have to stop and hold the water over the winter, a time when there is little plant growth to absorb those nitrates. Jim Doherty, the rancher turned county commissioner, raised the issue with the port. One of the port commissioners said, dear God, what would you have us do? Shut down one of the industries? Well, if you're gonna trade that industry functioning and the dollars they're making with lives that are being lost, hell yes. The port is just one of the players here, one of the most visible because they have state water permits. I wanted to talk with their leaders about their wastewater program, but they declined. In May of 2022, the then director, Richard Whitman, during a meeting of the DEQ Commission, acknowledged the problem in the Lubguama area and the lack of power to do much about it. We've already talked a little bit about Port Morrow and I've mentioned Plan Weston also. What I really want to say is those are two important facilities, operations, but they're by no means the only um, source of groundwater contamination in that area. Um, we know that we also have um, groundwater contamination that's resulted from uh, some of the confined animal feeding operations in the area. We also, and, and perhaps more broadly, um, have issues with regard to fertilizer application by um, agricultural operations in the area. He also said the DEQ does not have the laws it needs to protect Oregon's groundwater. DEQ for several biennia now has suggested that we need a broader um, public process around our programs for protecting groundwater. And do we need legislation um, to improve the systems that we have for groundwater protection. And so nothing changed, leaving people who rely on well water exposed to pollution and angry. Our county commissioners could stop it, but they don't. They can say no. Our port commissioners can say no. 
us clean it up. They don't. I'm not blaming the farmers. I'm not blaming the industry. But they all got to work together to get this solved. And they need to solve it right away. It's a problem that many believe regulators have allowed to continue for far too long. So what do you think about um, the fact that this has been a growing problem for 30 years? <sighs> I'm, uh, I'm embarrassed for our, for our leaders in the community, uh, the, the, those that have covered it up and kicked it under the rug for so many years. I, I don't even know where to go with that one, but... Um. Mitch Wolgamott has watched the lack of progress since his retirement from the DEQ. And does it also help that it's low-income, Spanish-speaking folks that are mostly impacted? Oh, absolutely, that's a factor. That's too bad. The people with the, the least voice tend to be the low-income and Hispanic folks. Farmer Jake Madison, a member of the current Loop Guama committee, disagrees. But has it taken so long because there wasn't much publicity or there was confusion or it, was there a piece of it because it's mostly poor Hispanic folks that are using these wells or? I wouldn't say that that's the case. I would say that the, the confusion is who has the power to do anything about it. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, which regulatory agency is in charge, which counties in charge. Despite the questions, one fact is undeniable. After all this time, the problem is not better. It's worse. The voluntary actions are not working to reduce the groundwater contamination. The community wonders if that will ever change. One thing is changing. The first Loop Guama committee eventually gave way to a second committee and then that second committee was shut down and now there's a third committee studying the problem. So we need, we need to show the com community that irrigated ag is doing its job and doing it efficient, efficiently, and not just by words, but with data. In August of 2023, the third Loop Guama committee gathered in Boardman for a work session that included presentations from leaders in the Department of Agriculture and complicated diagrams of how various agencies were involved in the issue. Committee members broke up into groups to brainstorm ways to work on the problem. We have our groundwater database that doesn't talk to DEQ's groundwater database. It doesn't talk to you know, uh, what OHA is doing or what the counties are doing. It was almost as if the contamination in northern Moro and Umatilla counties had just been discovered. In the summer of 2022, Jim Doherty had enough. So he declared a county emergency. You know, I sent an email out to some folks and I said, we are going to get tremendous pushback. And they're gonna push back for the wrong reasons. I said, but we need to stand strong. I said, because this will be for the county in many ways, um, you know, the turning point in healing, right? And, uh, you know, I, I grew thick skin pretty fast. The pronouncement quickly grabbed headlines. It marked the first time in Oregon history a county had declared an emergency over groundwater. It also marked the beginning of the end of Doherty's time in county politics. Months later, he was recalled from office. Because this was the right thing to do and I knew it in my heart. The forces against him were powerful, but the emergency declaration had its intended effect. It made things happen. It moved the state to begin testing wells and spreading awareness. In September of 2022, the legislature approved an emergency payment of $881,000 to the Oregon Health Authority. It was to test wells in the area and provide special filters for families with high levels of contamination. Governor Tina Kotek went to Morrow County in May of 2023 to promise state help at a town hall meeting. And in the summer of 2023, teams from the Oregon Health Authority followed up and visited more than 1,000 well owners to get samples of their water. OHA sent us this video of the process. Even though the state had identified the problem three decades prior, no one had a complete database on how many homes and how many wells were affected. Each morning we started with a safety briefing and had teams, at least 10 teams in the morning and the evening, out uh, canvassing in uh, neighborhoods. Uh, each team had a English and Spanish speaking um, individual in the team. 
So when the door was open, we were able to um, offer full services. The state hoped to offer free tests to 3,300 well owners by the end of September, but some roads had no trespass signs and others had no one home. In the end, the state tested, as of late October, the wells of 1,624 households. In Morrow County, of the 462 tests, 32% came back higher than 10 milligrams. That represents 147 households. In Umatilla County, of the 1,162 tests, 18% came back higher than 10 milligrams, representing 214 households. Many more homes with wells still need to be tested. And while it's great to warn people now, it's little comfort to some like Maria Martinez, who discovered she's been drinking contaminated water for more than 30 years. Because it's like we're out here, we shouldn't be um, suffering here with poisonous water, endangering our children, having um, health issues with them, or other people up here that have issues, to have more issues on top with this water. Maria had her water tested after the county declared the emergency. She said water that she thought was safe actually had nitrate levels four times the EPA's danger limit. She's one of many people I met in Morrow County who believe their health problems came from drinking that contaminated water, but no one can prove it. And the public health manager in charge of the well testing for Oregon Health Authority said, there's no way to know if Maria's miscarriages or other people's illnesses are linked to that nitrate water. We do have the research that definitely documents that high nitrates are not good for people. So even if we can't draw a straight line to somebody's, if, an individual's health effects, we know that it's not good. And we know that the action is to get people safe water. So what about the future? What's to be done about the polluted aquifer and the people, as many as 12,000, that use that water for drinking and cooking? First, the state is continuing to urge people in the lower Umatilla Basin to get their well tested. It's free. And taxpayers are footing the bill for weekly water deliveries to 256 homes in Morrow County and 122 in Umatilla County. All have wells with nitrate readings of 10 or higher. Businesses in the area are funding a group called H2O for Eastern Oregon, which has provided information about the dangers, along with testing and filters for 300 well owners. But some wonder, is that all that can be done? Is that the future? Emergency bottles of water delivered every two weeks? forever? Bottled water um, is basically a band-aid at this point. Um, as the governor, we agree with the governor, she said, you know, folks can't keep lugging jugs of water forever. Um, so folks need to have a permanent water source. Kristen Ostrom is the executive director of a grassroots nonprofit in Eastern Oregon called Oregon Rural Action. It was founded in 2021 and is concerned about the polluted groundwater in the lower Umatilla Basin. They're also helping organize residents there. And so we've got to be looking at our regulations of the sources of the water, as well as looking at the, the approach that the state of Oregon has been using for 30 years. And that's a voluntary approach um, by the folks who are contributing uh, the, the nitrate levels. We have to be looking at that approach. Is that effective um, as we're continuing to see the nitrate levels go up? Well, what do you think? Is it effective? I don't think it's been effective at all. Um, I think community members who are discovering that the water out of their tap is not good to drink uh, don't think that that um, has been effective. There is one obvious solution that few want to suggest. Cut way back or shut down on the sources of nitrate and make it mandatory. Tell the farmers to stop. Tell the Port of Moro and other food processors to stop. Tell the feedlots to stop putting nitrates on the ground. Reducing nitrates is an obvious solution to the man who used to be a top executive with the Department of Environmental Quality for Eastern Oregon. What's the long-term solution? Less nitrogen and less water on the ground. I mean, the, the only way this can be solved is to have less nitrogen. And I'm not talking about small farmers here. I'm, I'm talking about the big industrial circles. Um, there's no regulation at all there. They don't even have to tell the government how much they're putting on the ground. Uh, so it's difficult to uh, regulate it uh, under the current rules. But taking on farming or feedlots or the Port of Moro is no small task. They're each important economic engines in the area. And farmers, most are not regulated. Jake Madison farms 10,000 acres in Echo, Oregon, about 16 miles from the Port of Moro. His farm is one of the places that spreads the port's nitrate-laced water. It acts as fertilizer for his crops. He is regulated and monitored by the state because he reuses that port water. 
But again, most farmers are not. Jake's thought about solutions for the aquifer pollution, things like restricting how close to a well nitrogen-laced water can be put on the soil, or somehow recharging the underground aquifer with fresh water from the Columbia River. And I can hear someone out there saying, well, why don't we just stop farming this land and let it all rest for 100 years? Don't say it with your mouth full. I mean, at the end of the day, that's, yeah, that, that wouldn't fix it. You know, it's, um, that wouldn't fix it. It is true that no one seems to know what it would take to fix the polluted aquifer or how long that would take. But some community members are fed up with the decades of delay and want action now. Raymond Akers, who has a polluted well, wants the Port of Morrow to immediately stop spreading nitrate water anywhere. I hear that the, the DEQ just give them another permit so they're allowed to just continue doing what they're doing and uh, no harm, no foul for four years, and that's unacceptable. We'll never in our grandkids' lifetime get this under control if we don't stop the spigot. Shut the spigot off, then we can start working on a, on a solution. Mike Pearson also lives in the contaminated zone and agrees it is past time for action. I got great grandkids. I want it cleaned up so their kids will be gone. I'm not doing this for my own self. I'm looking forward to my grandkids and my great grandkids. One thing is crystal clear. 30 plus years of voluntary guidelines has not worked here. The state's efforts have been a failure. The problem of nitrates polluting the aquifer in the lower Umatilla Basin is worse now than when it was first discovered.